what I want to do is just summarize some of the things that I learned about how leaders began to craft what would become a legacy of influence. How did they actually sort of shape uh, their own legacy and uh, how did that actually take shape? Over the course of the uh, research, I interviewed a lot of folks who were uh, entrepreneurs who ended up leading large organizations, uh, as well as uh, folks who were in uh, government and in nonprofit life. And I found that there's a number of different ways in which they could take shape. I'm going to share with you six stories of individuals who I thought had amazing examples that could be instructive for us, whatever kind of responsibilities we might have. This is Horst Schulze. When Horst was a young man, uh, he went to trade school in his native land of Germany. And um, he was learning how to actually manage and run hotels. It was the um, industry that was focused on tourism and hospitality. As a 15-year-old, he was asked to write his manifesto for the hospitality industry. That was sort of his senior project he had to do. And he would walk to school every morning and working on it. One day he went and heard a sermon on uh, the Genesis 1 and how we are made in the image of God. Horst has grown up in the church. He's a person of deep faith. And it dawned on him that he was very uncomfortable with one of the basic mantras of the hospitality business, particularly in Europe at that time, which in essence treated the staff members of these luxury hotels as second-class citizens. Simple things, for example, that when a guest came down the hallway, the staff were instructed to look down so as not to intrude in the personal space of the guest. He said that actually creates an image where we, we get this idea that the staff members are at a lower station in life, and I didn't like that. So he decided that he would take some of the theological ideas he was hearing in church and build it into a framework that would inform how he thought about the business. And in essence, what he did is he said, we need to create um, a mantra that says, we, in essence, are ladies and gentlemen serving ladies and gentlemen. That an idea that you would say, we are uh, on the same sort of, we have the same human dignity. We are equally made in the image of God. He took that manifesto, wrote it, and he said that was probably the best thing that he wrote. He held on to it for a while. He made his way up through um, different businesses, and in the 1980s, he was uh, a senior leader at Hyatt Hotels based in Chicago. A group of different people decided that they wanted to launch a luxury brand of hotels, and they wanted Horst to be the person who would build the culture of that company. As it turns out, he wanted to build an organizational culture that had biblical resonance, but that would also uh, work well from a business standpoint. The company that was started was Ritz-Carlton Hotels and Resorts. And so Horst said, I'm happy to do that as long as you let me build the culture that I want. The investor said, that sounds just great. So do you know what the basic mantra of Ritz-Carlton Hotels and Resorts is to this day? We are ladies and gentlemen serving ladies and gentlemen. In fact, if you stay at a Ritz-Carlton Hotel, you'll get a note of thanks at the end of your stay, and it's signed by the ladies and gentlemen of Ritz-Carlton Hotels and Resorts. As it turned out, Ritz-Carlton was uh, very successful as a commercial venture. They won the Malcolm Baldrige Award twice. They're the only company who won this very high esteemed award that's given by the Department of Commerce. They won it twice. The second time they won it, Horst said, all of our competitors came to our corporate headquarters to say, what is it that makes a difference? How is it that you're so different than the rest and you're able to distinguish yourselves? And he said, well, frankly, you've got to get your biblical stories right. You've got to get your theology of the way in which you think about businesses. He built an organizational culture that was organized around basically faith. And it was one that actually competitors came to study a very significant way. Another interesting thing that I found is that public leaders, particularly in government, drew upon their faith in surprising ways. When I interviewed President Carter, I was struck by how he would uh, draw upon his evangelical faith in ways that sometimes caught people by surprise. For example, if you had to guess what was the most significant uh, foreign policy achievement of the Carter White House, do you remember? Camp David Accords, absolutely. The Camp David Accords, where Jimmy Carter brokered the first and lasting peace Israel has known with one of its Arab neighbors. It was a negotiation that took place between Menachem Begin and Anwar Sadat. 
the interesting thing, this is a picture of the three men. It, I don't know if you know the backstory, but actually Menachem Begin and Amor Sadat did not see each other at Camp David until they were signing the agreement together. They were always in separate rooms and Jimmy Carter was the go-between. But one of the interesting things is that when the three leaders got to Camp David, they decided to do something a bit unusual. They did not issue a set of talking points, which is relatively common when you have a, a big uh, summit. They did not conduct a press conference or issue a press release. Instead, these three men, a Muslim, a Jew, and a Christian, issued a worldwide call to prayer. That's actually what they did at the start of the Camp David summit. And uh, I asked President Carter, what difference did that prayer make, he thought. And he said, there were many times when we felt like we actually were not going to get very far. We found that prayer became the glue that held us together. So personal diplomacy that was going throughout the process. It's very interesting because uh, as I interviewed President Carter, I was asking him, you know, what were difficult moments? And he said, at one point in time, Menachem Begum stormed out of the room and said, this is just not going to work. You know, we just cannot see eye to eye with the Egyptians. And President Carter's staff sort of ran after Menachem Begin, and the president said, no, 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 let me go talk with them. And so he goes out onto the porch, and he stands beside Menachem Begin. He says, you know, Menachem, um, I teach uh, Sunday school at the Baptist church where Rosalind and I have been going for a long time. And he said, we Christians have so much to benefit from you Jews. I mean, there's so much of our tradition that is informed and deeply appreciative of the, the significant influence that you've had. He said, you know, there's one concept that I think you Jews understand so much better than we do. And it's this concept, the biblical notion of shalom. And he said, so much of what we Christians think about peace, it's just sort of the cessation of peace fighting, but we don't have this deep biblical understanding of what shalom really means. And he said, I so much appreciate and admire that from your tradition and think that it has so much to teach us. And he said, Menachem, don't you want your granddaughter to experience shalom with one of her Arab neighbors. That's what we're about today. That was actually the turning point in the Camp David Accords. That one conversation that Jimmy Carter had with Menachem Begum. Just as I told you before the break about how an individual leader's story can be very significant in a critical moment, I actually found that faith came up many times in the interviews that I conducted. And actually, people were able to tell very poignant stories about how their faith made a significant difference at a key moment. One of the things that worries me is that we've moved in an, in an era where, frankly, the church is not serving a lot of the business leadership community that it served at one point in time. We've got to do a better job of trying to connect those folks because they're going to draw upon faith in profound ways if it's meaningful in their life. I also found that there's a dimension in which you have to really draw upon your faith in times of crisis and in, in moments of, of real challenge. Um, one of the, the key things that uh, I think is important is how Scripture can speak into difficult and challenging times. James 1 says, Blessed is a man who remains steadfast under trial, for when he stood the test, he'll receive the crown of life, which God's promised to those who love him. That, one of the key things that I encountered is how humbling situations have a way of helping to instill a sense of hope. This is Barry Rowan. Barry is one of the leading business leaders in the telecommunications business. He's been with Vonage uh, most recently. But about 10 years ago, he moved to Sao Paulo, Brazil, to launch a telecommunications, a wireless business in Brazil. At the time, Brazil was the fifth most populous country in the world, but as far as the connections over wireless communications, they were something like 120th in the world. So it's the fifth most populated country, but they have uh, they're about 120 in terms of the, the penetration of the wireless market. So you and I know, I mean, we rely upon our cell phones to do all kinds of things. And it has a way of empowering, particularly developing economies where they don't want to put in the landlines with the wiring. Actually, 
wireless has been incredibly empowering to allow people to do everything from talking to their mother on their deathbed before they pass to being able to get emergency services when you need it to being able to actually manage your finances online banking all these things are amazing things so Barry moves down to Brazil to start this uh, telecommunications company based in Brazil and he said it was an amazing opportunity because we had so many people who did not have cell phones and they were very excited about it and so he said we were signing up tens of thousands of customers every day. He said, we were just growing our business significantly. But after about six months, we noticed a problem, which was people were not paying their bills. And he said, we began to run into a real cash problem because we're making all these investments, and yet nobody was actually paying their bill, or very few. And he said, we learned that there was maybe a reason why some of these people had not had landlines before, and that we had signed up a whole cohort of people who did not have sort of a mindset that you would necessarily pay your bills on time or you pay your bills in full. And as it turned out, they went through a season of about 12 months of this problem, and in the end, the company could not sustain it, and it folded. And he said, I felt like such a colossal failure. I moved down to start this business. It has this meteoric rise. We're the darling of the telecommunications business. And then within a year, we actually have to fold because people were not paying their bills. And he said, I had to get to a place where I realized Whatever professional success I've enjoyed is actually a great gift from God. And my, my calling is to just not necessarily be successful, but just faithful. Faithful in that particular calling. I actually found most of the people that I interviewed who were very serious Christians. So about 70% of the people I interviewed were, would identify as Christian. But actually about 50% of the people I interviewed, I would say were serious enough about their faith where they were trying to practice it with great regularity and have that part of their daily or weekly routines. Those individuals, the, that cohort of people, they had this ability and they drew upon their faith to help them to develop sort of grit and resilience, to be able to maintain an even keel over the times of both success and failure. And I found that to be certainly true in the case of Barry and how he would actually take shape. I told the story about uh, Dr. Rice and the way in which her, uh, her faith sort of sustained her and the way in which you, uh, she drew upon this sort of journey in, um, with her own mother. So th this is actually Dr. Rice as a young uh, girl, and that's her mom beside her. And um, as we were talking, I asked her about how did she sort of uh, draw upon her faith earlier in life. It's a very interesting story. I don't know if you know, Condoleezza Rice was a, is a world-class pianist, piano player, very talented. When she was 15 years old, she was at the Van Cliburn competition, which is a, you know, one of the very most selective competitions. And she said, I had spent an entire year perfecting this particular piece that I was going to play. And she said, you know, there's a lot of competitors, but you get to know the other people who are in the competition. And she said, there was a, a, a guy, a young man, who decided that he was actually playing the same piece that I played. And she said, I listened to it. He performed before I did. And she said, he was masterful. She said, the level of not just technical competence, but frankly, musical giftedness just oozed out of his performance. And she said, I assume, she said, you know, I practiced that piece for a year, and I thought it was a pretty good pianist. And she said, so I assumed he probably had been practicing for a really long time. I got to know him and actually learned that he had decided two weeks ago to change the piece that he was playing. So he practiced that piece for two years. And she said, I have my first really major identity crisis in that moment. I had spent a year of my life perfecting this piece, thinking that I'm destined to be a world-class pianist, piano performer, when I, when I actually learned that there's somebody else who played the exact same piece who was able to do it better than I could do it, and he practiced for two weeks. She said, I, I realized in that moment that all of the images I had for my life and what my life was going to look like actually were not going to come to fruition. I don't know about you, but 
Each of us probably experiences moments of that where you sort of think life is going to go in a certain direction and ends up not being exactly the way you expect it. It doesn't line up exactly in that same way. Um, in my own life, uh, Rebecca and I had our first daughter, Elizabeth, and uh, Rebecca had a typical pregnancy. And then uh, when Elizabeth was born, we began to realize that she was not making certain kinds of milestones. At about nine months, we learned that she was, uh, something was uh, severely wrong with her, but we didn't know. And it actually took a couple of years for us to learn that she had a very rare genetic disorder that had profound implications for her life. Um, if you looked at Elizabeth, she looks typical, but she has a profound cognitive disability. She's 11 now, but she has the intellectual development of about an 18-month-old. She doesn't really have language, so she can make noises, but you wouldn't know what she's trying to say. Parenting her has been really different than we expected. And I think each of us have moments where we sort of develop uh, sort of expectations, and sometimes those expectations come true, and sometimes they don't. I asked Dr. Rice, how is it that she sort of regained her composure after she realized that what she had thought her whole life was going to be spent doing ended up materializing? And she said, well, I went off to the University of Denver at age 16. I graduated high school early. And she said, I thought I was going to play in a music conservatory, and we decided, nope, that's not my future. So I'm going to try and explore other, op other possibilities. As a freshman, she took a class on international relations that was taught by a man named Joseph Corbell. And she said he just had this passion for the Soviet Union and was able to sort of talk about the Russian people and um, the Soviet era. And she said, I just became fascinated with the Soviets under him. And it just opened up within me a real interest in, in some, something that I had not quite expected. She said, I had never studied Russian, but suddenly I was taking a Russian class. She said, I knew very little about this, but he just awakened within me a passion. And as a result of this deep struggle that I had, I actually developed another love in my life. She said, I still love playing the piano. It's a lot of fun. But actually, my career has been made out of my interest in the Soviet Union. The interesting little side note about that is that that Professor Joseph Corbell, does anyone know who his daughter is? Joseph Corbell is the father of Madeleine Albright. So he actually mentored the first two women who were secretaries of state. Amazing story. So sometimes the struggles that come in our life, God's able to give us a sense of Christian vision. And, and for Condoleezza Rice, that's true. So she's a, a person of serious faith. And she found that she was able to develop a new sense of vocation of what God was calling her to. And then, in the midst of that, because of that kind of experience, she was the person who was able to help advance that PEPFAR agenda that we talked about before the break. This is a way in which we make uh, using our personal struggles to advance the common good. There's a researcher at the University of Pennsylvania named Angela Duckworth, a psychologist, who has found that probably one of the most important traits that we can instill in young people that allows them to succeed over the long haul is what she calls grit, perseverance, the ability to stay with something over the long haul. And that's one of the things that we can actually encourage young people in the church. So one of the key things we need to do is to try and push people to actually stick with things, to not give up, to have that kind of endurance. Yesterday, when I was talking to a group of folks who work with um, young people, one of the most important things that I think we have to do is we have to actually encourage young people to fail more often and more frequently, more frequently and faster. That actually failure is one of the most important traits in going through it in developing grit. Why? Because as a way of relativizing, failure is not debilitating. It's a lesson that you learn. This is Colleen Barrett. Colleen Barrett is a very interesting woman. She never graduated from college. She uh, was a legal secretary in the late 1960s working for an attorney in San Antonio, Texas. Uh, at the time, uh, she was working for a man named Herb, and uh, she was helping him with his law practice. Herb ended up uh, getting involved in starting a very small little airline business that was uh, based on the idea of trying to connect three different cities, Dallas, San Antonio, and Houston. It was a triangle. It literally started on the back of a cocktail napkin at a, at a bar. 
And uh, Herb had this idea that there ought to be a way in which more people could be able to travel around more frequently. This is the beginning of Southwest Airlines. At the time, Herb was the legal secretary of the corporation that became Southwest Airlines. And um, then the CEO who started the company in 1970 walked away from the company, and so the board at a board meeting voted Herb to become the CEO. Well, you can't be both in the state of Texas. You couldn't be both the CEO and the legal secretary. So they said, what are we going to do? And he said, I'll get my secretary to be the legal secretary. So Colleen Barrett was named the legal secretary of the corporation, and that began a 40-year career where Colleen Barrett basically became the person who built the organizational culture of Southwest Airlines. The person I'm talking about, Herb, is Herb Kelleher. He is a hard-charging uh, founder kind of uh, person. Uh, he drinks a lot. He smokes a lot. He swears a lot. In fact, if you invite him to give a lecture at a university in a very fancy place, he'll bring his cigarette literally to the podium, and he will drink some kind of whiskey on the stage. That's his style. Herb is not the kind of person you would build an organizational culture around. It'd be a very difficult culture. He needed somebody who would sort of help with the soft stuff. If you know anything about Southwest, you know that they have done a tremendous job of building a great employee loyalty, building a culture that tries to solve customers' problems using frontline employees. They don't have a human resources department. They have a people program. So they care about their people and they want to invest in it. And Colleen very much embodies that. She, ha she has sort of a framework and says, what I really wanted to do is I wanted to build an organizational culture where love was at the centerpiece of what we were doing. So they actually decided that they would make Dallas Love Field, which has the uh, shorthand abbreviation of LUV, that, that that was going to be sort of the, the way in which they would build the corporate culture. And if you know their, um, some of their logos and marketing, they've used a heart throughout there. She said, I want to practice sort of savvy kindness, that that's really important. And it has a profound effect. In fact, it's very interesting. Back about 10 years ago, um, American Airlines was in a deep dispute. Uh, the, the management, um, uh, Bob Crandall, who was the CEO, was in a deep dispute with the labor unions. And the labor unions took a full page ad out in the Dallas Morning News because American is based at, at DFW Airport, took a full-page ad out where they basically aired their grievances with the senior management of American Airlines in the, this full-page ad. Two days later, the labor union at Southwest Airlines took out a full-page ad praising their CEO, Herb Kelleher. And they said, the reason we do this is because we love him and we know he loves us. Actually, love is incredibly important when you're building an organizational culture. It makes a huge difference. Colleen describes it as savvy kindness. When I went to do the interview with her, I said, um, Colleen, uh, you know, tell me what, uh, you're, what's keeping you busy these days. She said, well, actually, I'm in the midst of moving. But I can't move just yet, but I'm in the midst of moving. I said, oh, are you leaving Dallas? She said, no, I'm just, I'm downscaling. I'm moving from a house to a condo. And she said, I'm, I'm ready to go, but I just can't move in yet. And I said, oh, is it still under construction? She said, no, 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 it's ready to go, but I'm actually hosting a wedding, and I, I can't leave just yet. And I said, oh, whose wedding? I thought it was probably your daughter or something. And she said, oh, I don't know. It's some flight attendant. And I said, a flight attendant? She said, yeah. She said, she's having her wedding in my backyard. And I said, and you don't know her? And she said, no, I don't really know her. I said, well, that's kind of strange. You're waiting to move to a new place while this wedding is occurring. I said, when's the wedding occurring? She said, it's in like three months. I said, you're waiting three months for this wedding and you don't know who it is? And she said, yeah, but that's no big deal. I said, well, how did you decide to have the wedding? She said, oh, when this flight attendant got engaged, she wrote me a letter and said, I hear you have a big backyard. Could I come and have my wedding in your backyard? And Colleen said, I said, of course, we're happy to do that. And she said, I love these people, so I want to try and help them as much as I can. Building an organizational culture where love is actually part of the framework of the organization, that makes a very positive difference. I interviewed 550 extraordinary people, but the person who impressed me the most, the person who actually I think is one of the most talented leaders I've ever been fortunate enough to get to know, is this guy, Mike Ullman. Mike's an extraordinary uh, man. He was a graduate of the University of Cincinnati, 
And he was tapped by Warren Bennis, who was the president of the University of Cincinnati at the time, to be the chief financial officer of his alma mater at age 29. It's a campus of 40,000 people, and at age 29, Mike is the CFO. He goes on uh, and ends up having a successful uh, run into the retail business. He started with federated department stores and moved up through the ranks. He actually was named the CEO of Macy's in the 1990s. He led them out of bankruptcy in a very difficult uh, situation. He then was invited to go uh, to Hong Kong, where he basically ran an organization called Wharf Holdings. Wharf Holdings controls the port of Hong Kong. And he started a business called DFS. It was the beginning of what is now known as duty-free shops. So Mike is the person who came up with the idea that airports and other transportation places where international travelers are going, that they could actually sell luxury goods that wouldn't be taxed. And so that was Mike's idea, and he started an entire industry. It began in Hong Kong, began to spread, and because luxury goods began to be really important in that particular market, it attracted the attention of Bernard Arnault. Bernard Arnault was the owner of LVMH, Louis Vuitton Moet Hennessy. It's the luxury goods conglomerate based in Paris that owns every luxury good you could possibly imagine, about 150 different brands. And he was so impressed with Mike, he said, I want you to come uh, to Paris and be my CEO and run this organization. Now, it's interesting because uh, Mike and his wife, Kathy, very committed Christians, had adopted two daughters while they were in Hong Kong, two girls who were of Chinese descent, who had <clears throat> severe disability. And um, he knew that the kind of care and service that they needed, they actually, the best place for them to get it was in San Francisco. He had developed a relationship with the University of California at San Francisco. And UCSF had a wonderful medical center that cared for both of his daughters better. And so he said, I, you know, I'm just not sure... I can make the move to Paris. Bernard Arnault said, no problem, live in San Francisco and commute to Paris. So that's actually what he did. He commuted to Paris every week. That is quite an intense commute. The thing that makes it more remarkable is that Mike has a degenerative spinal condition that makes it difficult for him to walk. In fact, if Mike were to enter the sanctuary in the back and come up here, he would actually have to make his way here on a Segway. He couldn't actually make the walk because he's got real pain. Um, he's had tremendous challenges. He has dyslexia, which makes it where he really cannot read, pretty much. He was an average student because he really had trouble processing the information. Been a very successful businessman. He has that relational entrepreneurship I was describing to you. Incredible humility. Deep sense of faith. He's been a CEO on three continents. He was named the CEO of J.C. Penney in 2004. When he was named into that job, uh, Penney's was on the brink of bankruptcy. He was able to draw upon all the different work that he was doing and actually build the right kind of organization. He said, I learned that you have to lead with your life. People have to sort of know who you are. He told me a very interesting story about the day that he was named the CEO of J.C. Penney. It was 2004. And he said, I went to this rally that was held in the corporate headquarters in um, Dallas, and I was seated uh, on the front row. And I wasn't planning on being introduced, but as it turned out, that's what the board decided they wanted to do. In the middle of the rally, they said, you know, we're just so excited. We have some exciting news to share with you. As it turns out, we've made our selection for the new CEO, and he's here with us today. Ladies and gentlemen, please join us on this, uh, please uh, uh, join us welcoming to the stage, Mike Ullman. And, of course, everybody starts clapping, getting very excited. And Mike realized, I've got a problem. Because to get onto stage, I've got to get up there, and there's no railing. So he waited until the clapping stopped. And then he, from the front row, he asked the person, can I have the microphone? And so he sort of stood up and turned around and said uh, to the audience, you know, so much about our work together is going to involve trust. And so I found it helpful for us to have trust experiments early on in my tenure when I'm working with a team. So I want to try something very unconventional. I'd like to ask everyone in this room if you would please bow your heads and close your eyes and keep those closed until I tell you to look up. So I'd like to do that. So I'd like you to bow your heads. Everybody here, bow your heads and close your eyes.
after about a minute, Mike said, okay, you can look up. And uh, so at that point, he was actually here behind the podium that was a center stage. And he said, now one of the key things that you need to know is that I'm really going to rely upon you to trust me and for me to trust you. And one of the great challenges that we all face is that we have different obstacles in our life. And it's requiring us to have each other's back. The reason why I wanted you to, to close your eyes and to bow your heads is because I needed to do something that was embarrassing for myself. I actually had to make my way from the front row all the way up here. And what you did not see while your heads were bowed and your eyes were closed is that I literally crawled on the floor on my hands and knees up the stairs, got to the podium, and then pulled myself up here before I told you to look at me. You see, I have challenges in my life. But the challenges do not keep me from being excited about this job or excited about what we can do together. But it's going to take us working together to actually build the kind of company we want. I hope you'll join me in that venture. It was an amazing, teachable moment where a CEO was able to basically sort of acknowledge he didn't have everything all put together and that he needed the team to stand with him. In the end, Mike Ullman did an amazing job. He uh, ended up turning around the company. By the time he stepped down and retired in 2011, two out of five American families were doing business with JCPenney every year. 40% of the American population shopped at JCPenney. Their customer service scores were the industry leader. They were higher than Nordstrom's. Their employee in engagement scores were higher than that of Starbucks. I mean, it was just unbelievable. He turned over the reins to another guy, a, a very smart guy named Ron Johnson. And uh, Ron Johnson had come to JCPenney from Apple. Ron is the person who built Apple's retail business. So he literally designed the Apple retail stores, which had been wildly successful. And Ron's a good man. Uh, he's a person of faith and uh, had been wildly successful at Apple. He was deeply influenced by Steve Jobs. And Steve Jobs had said to him, as his parting bit of advice, Ron, whatever you do when you go to, J go to JCPenney, don't listen to anybody. Do what your heart tells you. And so that's what he did. Unfortunately, what his heart told him was not a successful business strategy. He ended up saying, we're not going to have people clip coupons. We're going to change the sort of structure of our business. We're going to get rid of all, uh, most of our merchandise, replace it with different kind of merchandise, and redesign the JCPenney store. In a matter of one year, the company lost a uh, billion dollars in business, and they lost virtually all of their loyal customers and attracted no new customers. They had to do amazing degrees of layoffs. Uh, 19 of the top 21 officers of the company left uh, over that course of that year. I mean, it was just tremendous turmoil. The board in the end said, we've got to, we've got to save the company if we can. So uh, um, they decided they need to replace Ron Johnson. And then the question is, who are they going to replace him with? Who is going to be able to somehow bring this back together? The JCPenney board did something that is unheard of in Fortune 500 companies. They brought the former CEO out of retirement. They called Mike Ullman and said, would you consider coming to, to work for us? He said, not only would I do it, I'll work for a dollar a year because I love those people and I want to help them. And I asked um, Mike, who ends up became a, a good friend and a mentor. He serves on the board of trustees at Gordon. His daughter, Maddie, has been a student at Gordon. Uh, just an amazing man. I went to go visit him two weeks after he returned to the job. So this was in 2013. And he had the same executive assistant who uh, met me in the lobby and then walked me back to his office. And I, I said, you know, does it feel different now that Mike is back? And she said, it is night and day. And I said, why? And she said, we know Mike loves us. And so we're ready to work for him with all of our heart. One of the key things is that part of the greatest act of love is a willingness to self-sacrifice, to give things up, to be willing to sort of be honest and transparent, to be vulnerable in uh, our leadership, and it can make a very positive di difference. One of the key things that Mike taught me is that you actually learn love through pain, that it's the struggle and the pain in our life that actually teaches us and gives us the capacity to love. These are six individuals who had different stories that 
each of which taught me a key lessons about how you build a legacy of influence. I told you in the first session that I'm, what I'm trying to do is help us to think institutionally, but also to act personally, to hold those things together. There are three cardinal virtues in the Christian faith, starting with faith. So you have then hope and then love. The example of building an institutional culture organized around faith was Horst Schultze and the work that he had done at Ritz-Carlton, where literally you take the theological idea of the imago Dei, the image of God, and build it into the very understanding of how you shape the organization and institutional culture. How do you build an institution or, or institutional response and building institutional resilience organized around hope is the example of Barry Rowan, the guy who was able to bounce back from the experience of building the telecommunications company in Brazil and then going on to be the head of Vonage. And then you've got the example of Colleen Barrett, where love becomes part of the corporate mantra and culture at Southwest Airlines. Examples of where it ha happens on a personal basis, you've got the, the work of Jimmy Carter, work of Men Menachem Begin and Anwar Sadat, where he basically uses the theological lesson of the Jewish concept of shalom, which becomes a turning point at the Camp David Accords. Example of Condoleezza Rice, who basically uh, bounces back from the devastating decision that um, she was not going to be the concert pianist she'd always thought and ends up developing a career in uh, international relations, which gives her a degree of personal per perseverance, being able to make the long-term impact where she served as national security advisor and secretary of state. And then the example of Mike Ullman. Six stories of individuals who I encountered out of 550 who had basically figured out how they built a legacy of influence organized around cardinal Christian virtues of faith, hope, and love. That's, in essence, how I found folks were able to craft a legacy of influence and elevate the contribution that they made for Christ and for the common good. Um, I want to take just five minutes to see if there are questions you'd like to ask, and then we have a terrific panel that's lined up. But something that you're curious about, uh, if you've got a question, we've got a, Terry's got a microphone. We're happy to bring that to you. Sean's got another one. Someone have a question they'd like to pose. I um, have tons and tons of nieces and nephews, like 86. And I want to know what 86? I, yeah. I want to know what I can do to influence their lives hmm. and their success. That's a big question. Um, One of the practical things that I think makes a really positive difference is exposing uh, young people to uh, opportunities to serve other people who don't have as many blessings or opportunities as they do. So a very practical thing of instilling a, a, a spirit of service and of sacrifice, um, helping uh, your nieces and nephews to, uh, to travel, to, to meet people that they can help and bless, to be involved in service opportunities in the local community, and to have sort of a, a spirit of service, something that you cultivate early on, and it stays with you over a long call. So that would be one simple thing that I think could probably make a key difference. And even more practically is using holidays as occasions to serve other people. So things, what can you do around Thanksgiving to serve a warm meal? What can you do around Christmas? What can you do on the 4th of July to bless and encourage other people? Those are, those are practical things. Question over here. John. You know, one of the uh, one of the gurus on the secular side has, uh, about leadership has been Jim Collins. Mm -hmm. I'd be interested in how you would contrast what he calls level five leadership with what you just put up in, in terms of your grid. Yeah. So uh, Jim Collins' work is, is tremendously uh, influential and I think has been uh, – really important. I think that probably one of the key points of resonance that I found in my research that really is in complete alignment with Collins is the, the um, interesting blend of both interpersonal or personal humility and organizational or institutional pride. So there's a sense in which the person is personally humble, is not so interested in building their own personal resume, but they're very proud of the organization and they really want to build that up. I found that that, and that's one of the key characteristics of the level five leader he found, I found that that actually was perfectly resonant, especially with the Christian leaders I interviewed. I mean, you know, when you interview 550 people, you can interview a lot of different kinds of people, and some of them 
were not the kind of folks we want to emulate. But the people who impressed me, those platinum leaders, they had remarkable degrees of humility. And uh, they were very committed to success of their organization, but they were also not one who was actively seeking to get the credit. And it's interesting, you can actually learn this very quickly in an interaction, whether somebody is, has a, a, whether pride is a personal struggle in their life or not, right? It's how they talk about themselves. I, I would go in and interview somebody and you could, if they would start dropping names as if they were trying to impress me, and I'm thinking, you don't need to impress me. I'm already impressed with you. I've come to interview you. But there's a sense in which people were trying to prove themselves. There's, there's that segment that the people who were the platinum leaders that really impressed me, they were just, they had no airs about them. They were remarkably humble. They also tended to be the ones who were willing to give up some of the perks or privileges that went with their jobs, that they were willing to sacrifice, whether it came in the form of compensation or uh, simple things. I mean, I'll give you a, a great example of somebody who really impressed me. Um, that I didn't interview him, but he still impresses me, is Jim Daly, who's the head of Focus on the Family. So, um, you know, Focus on the Family is headquartered in Colorado Springs, and so they get winter weather there. So there's actually, the, when they design their facility, they set it up so that there's a garage, a private garage, that's always heated that the CEO's car could be parked in. And uh, so that, you know, you never had to get out into the elements. And it was done in part for some security and other reasons, but it's a really ni nice perk. So he'd never have to get snow off of his car. And he said, I just realized that actually if I wanted to sort of embody a spirit of sacrifice, I need to show that in the everyday live life. So he actually gave that parking space to his executive assistant. He was a woman who's about 62. And he said, I thought she shouldn't have to get the snow off her, her car. And so she gets to park in his I thought that was pretty cool. Yeah, please. So within uh, the a lot of business institutions and certainly within you know, a fair amount of government institutions, there's a little bit of animosity towards uh, a little bit of Christianity and, and bring faith to the workplace. How, I mean, as I look at these leadership uh, characteristics, I mean, they're deeply rooted in Christianity hmm. and kind of Judeo-Christian values. How overtly do leaders live out their place? It's a great question. Um, so I'd say that there is variation in that. So some people were willing to be very specific about their Christian faith, and other people were a bit more subtle about it. Typically what happened is that after the leader had been in place for about five years or so, they sort of became more comfortable, even if they were at publicly traded companies, for their faith to get out. Now they didn't do it necessarily through like a company newsletter, but uh, there were simple things like Archie Dunham, who was the CEO of ConocoPhillips, decided that he was going to share his calendar, his Outlook calendar, with the company so people could actually see what his calendar looked like. And um, he regularly goes to worship and speaks in Bible studies and does prayer breakfast and different things like that. And his HR office said, you really need to take that off, just schedule this personal time or something like that. And he said, no, this is actually how I bear witness to my faith so that people can know that the CEO does actually speak at prayer breakfasts. Those kinds of things I found folks tended to try and do. Very rarely did they get up and necessarily, you know, preach the gospel. But they, had, they used occasions, and they typically used occasions of organizations outside that gave them the opportunity for the, that platform to be shared. That's a great question. Well, we've got a terrific panel of folks. I'm going to invite John to come up and maybe introduce the panel. But let me just say I'm really glad to have you all here. Thank you very much for being with us. I hope that you found it to be somewhat useful. And uh, I hope if you're interested, feel free to pick up a copy of Faith and the House of Power. Thank you very much. God bless you all.